Good morning, everybody. My name is Tanner Matches, and um, I'm a graduate student and a secondary teacher candidate. And the topic that I'm going to be talking to you all about today, in terms of my teaching event, was how can we ensure that everyone has access to healthy food? So, I practice taught at Aldo Leopold Charter School, whose framework is one of direct experience, inquiry learning, and community involvement. My co-teacher, Pete Rankin, and I um, co-taught ninth grade cultural geography and economics and 10th grade world history. I felt fortunate at Aldo Leopold Charter School to have a lot of latitude in the content that I taught, given that it fit within that framework and that vision of Aldo Leopold Charter School, that of direct experience, inquiry learning, community involvement. In addition to that, we had this wonderful class that I also co-taught with um, Pete that was entitled Community Orientation. So every Friday, we had students going out and getting involved in the community. My task, and Pete and I's task, was to relate that, those community experiences, to the content that we were teaching in the classroom. And I'll talk more about that later in this presentation. So my learning, learning segment focused on geography of nutrition. And my essential question was, how can we ensure that everybody has access to healthy food? This uh, learning segment was focused in on the ninth grade cultural geography and economics class, of which there were 30 students, uh, 15 per class, and although Leopold Charter School uh, works as a block schedule, so later on in the presentation you'll see me referring to classes as different blocks. So it's not a prison cell that they were in, it's just the period. <laughs> so the idea with this learning segment was to prompt students to analyze those complex relationships between food cost, caloric density, and how that relates to socioeconomic status in the broader framework of social justice and social sustainability. This prompting students to really dig into those misconceptions, those ideas out there that eating unhealthy is just a choice. For many people that live in poverty, it's not a choice. I wanted students to critically engage in analyzing, digging in to that topic. So, I wanted to make my teaching event as student-centered as I possibly could. And the, the learning problem that I just spoke to was for students to create solutions to food insecurity. And the way I did that, the way I wanted to do that in the planning, was to meet those student academic needs of active reading, engaging in research, using that research that they conducted, it wasn't merely transmitting facts from one place to another, but actually collecting data on their own, and relate that to technical writing. So I planned in this uh, student-centered um, context how to, I plan to engage students in that critical thinking in relation to food access, food inequity, food insecurity, as it relates to social justice and social sustainability. So how I did that with this learning segment was first building students' background. And after that, we engaged in that food access research project. And then I had pre students present and communicate what they learned to the rest of the class, to teach the rest of the class. So, beginning with the building of the background, I gave students an overview of nutritional geography. Then we moved on to our first journal prompt, which was, how do government subsidies relate to take or economics and affect food access, affect access to healthy food? The point of this prompt was to tie what we had been learning in the first quarter in terms of taker economics and lever economics, and we won't go into the, the details therein, but it was a concept we learned from uh, a novel we were reading 
called My Asian Bill by Daniel Quinn. But the point was to engage what they had already learned into what we'd be learning in this segment on food. After that, we began a guided viewing of a documentary entitled A Place at the Table, which in my opinion was a fantastic way to frame this topic to the students. And it really illustrated how poverty and food insecurity and health issues related to those really go hand in hand. And I mentioned the guided viewing. This wasn't a passive viewing of this documentary. It didn't just let it go and that was it. We stopped at predetermined points throughout the documentary where we were able to really discuss what was going on, tie it back to that essential question, and dig into this topic deeper. After we concluded uh, the documentary, I had a guest speaker come into the classroom. And her name was Beck Anderson from the Volunteer Center. And what she talked to the students about was essentially food deserts, how Grant County is considered a food desert, how socioeconomic status relates to food access, and about food quality in food deserts. Which led us to our second journal prompt. What are some long-term solutions to increase food access in Grant County? How and why will your solutions work? And this was building up to the research projects that students engaged in. So the project was all about students collecting data to inform an analysis of those things, such as food costs, caloric density, and how that relates to socioeconomic status and ultimately social sustainability and social justice. So they collected data in class. I had a, a wide array of foods that um, students, um, they determined the cost of food. They determined how many calories were in this food item. And they had a, a range from unhealthy foods to healthy foods. So they calculated a uh, cost per calorie of each food item. And the idea was for them to use that data to inform a discussion in this broader context. And after that, I wanted students to communicate to me what they had learned through that project. And they did that by presenting their projects. And after the um, presentations concluded, I capped off the learning segment with a vocabulary exam, which I will talk about in a moment. So this kind of gives you a picture, these slides, or these photos, of the process that I just described. In the top left um, corner, see me working with students to, to build that background. I think in that photo where we're doing a vocabulary self-collection exercise on uh, various readings that students engaged in. So the point was to say, hey, why should we learn this vocabulary? What does it mean in this broader context of food, food insecurity? And in the top right um, corner, the students collecting the data on those food items. And in the bottom left, it's a picture of the students working on crafting their research projects. And finally, in the bottom right, the students presenting, communicating what they learned. So my instructional choices were, I wanted my instruction to be as multi-sensory and multimodal as I could to provide the students the learning opportunities. So we did that through the viewing of the documentary, many in-class discussions, writing assignments that I've described. We took notes on the whiteboard and I would take a photo of them and post them on a Facebook group that the students could access, and only the students could access, as a resource for their learning. I capitalized on small work, group work, active reading, research and technical writing, and whole class and small group discussion. I really found that activities such as the Think Pair Share were really good for those students who weren't comfortable being vocal to the whole class, so they were able to work in small groups and then communicate to the broader, uh, to the whole class, what they learned. There were opportunities for students to create with their project presentations. I tried to frame this this learning segment in terms of that real-world problem. How 
to ensure that everybody has access to healthy food. The whole point here is that I wanted students doing, not me standing up in the front of the class lecturing. So here are the result, or here is how I collected um, data and assessed students in terms of summative assessments. I tried to incorporate all the levels of Bloom's taxonomy in my summative assessment. So that meant for knowledge and comprehension using that vocabulary exam that I mentioned. For that application, synthesis, and evaluation, having students engage in the food access research project, and for the creation portion, their presentations on their project and how they devise solutions to food, in, food insecurity. So here were the results, and I'm going to summarize this data by uh, speaking to some measures of central tendency. For the vocabulary exam in C-Block, like I said, this was a class period, not a prison cell. <laughs> in C-Block, uh, for the vocabulary exam, 60% of the students met my objective, and that was for them to demonstrate that they knew the vocabulary I presented in class with 80% accuracy. There was an 85% median and a mean of 73%. For the research project, 47% of students met my objectives. There was a 63% median and a 45% mean. You may notice that there were a lot of zeros uh, in this chart, and that affected those measures of central tendency pretty drastically, but I'll speak more to how to mitigate those issues at the end of this presentation. For eBlock, the vocabulary exam, 46% of students met my objective. There was a median score of 65% and a mean of 63%. For the research project, 60% of students met my objectives, which were based on a, a rubric that I designed. There was a median of 70% and a mean of 64%. You notice that there are a lot less zeros in this graph, and the measures of central tendency reflect that. And speaking to student understanding, so I'd like to read a quote from one of the students' uh, research projects. So people buy this junk food to stay alive. For this reason, a lack of money causes obesity, which, let's face it, is ironic. You would expect that people who can't afford food would all be extremely skinny, but that's only because of the image of hungry people in our minds. There are people who can only afford cheap food, which means that they can only afford the fattening food. I thought that was a poignant picture of the understandings that students reached during this project. Excuse me. There were some barriers, barriers in terms of the students' project, and that was using data to inform their discussion and analysis of these issues. Many students and even include a graph that I required. But um, many students were much stronger at creative writing, and this was an opportunity for them to be introduced to technical writing in a structured way. But the students came up with some fantastic solutions uh, to, to food access and food insecurity. And some of those um, solutions included um, subsidizing healthy foods instead of unhealthy foods. Educating people on these topics and using community resources such as community gardening, uh, food banks. And so I was really proud of what students created. And that brings me to the community engagement portion. As I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, we have this class at Aldo called Community Orientation. And the task was to align those community events with the, the curriculum content. So students got to build community gardens. They got to volunteer at the volunteer center. They were actively engaged in the community concerning these topics. When we went on our uh, freshman trip uh, to Arizona, we 
looked at large-scale agriculture versus smaller-scale sustainable agriculture. So the point was we engaged the students in the community relating to these topics that I've been speaking to. What I learned from my students is that it's imperative that they're able to pursue their own unique passions within that curricular context. I feel that if I were have to differentiate it, those summative assessments more poignantly, a lot of those zeros would have been mitigated because students would be engaged and have the choices to communicate what they learned in a more effective way. So my recommendation is essentially I need to differentiate more. With that, I would like to say thanks, of course, to my partner, to my family, to Pete, my co-teacher, all the wonderful faculty and staff that have helped me in this process, and most importantly, I want to thank my students, and thank you all for listening.